I want you to turn your Bible to Joshua chapter 2, page 260 in the original Scofield Reference Bible. Joshua chapter 2, page 260. Reading the other day about this veterinarian was doctoring a little dog for skin problem. And a little dog jumped off the table and ran out the window and out into the car lot. And the veterinarian went out to try to find it. He was awfully excited about it. He wanted to find the little dog. He's down on his knees looking under a car. Then the yard attendant came by and wanted to know what he's doing. And he said, I need you to help me. I'm looking for a little itchy uh, pookie. And the yard attendant said, uh, I'm sorry I can't help you because I, I don't know the name of any of these Japanese cars. <laughs> I believe it was Ichi Poochie instead of Pookie. Well, okay, you need to learn the name of those cars, don't you? All right. I want you to write in and get my little book on the Holy Spirit, 52 7 point outlines on the Holy Spirit. And then uh, get Brother Lewis's book on the Song of Solomon and get a list of our cassette tape. Now, tape today will be tape number 340, 340, 340. I'm speaking today on this subject, the person whose life hung by thread. You can order the tape by title or by number. And we'll send the tape out to you in appreciation for a gift of $3.00. Help take care of our radio expense, add an extra dollar and get the uh, book on the Song of Solomon by Brother Lewis. We'd be glad to send you a list of our tape and you can select the ones you'd like to have. If you'd like to have our brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour for next year, then request that we get that in the mail also. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501. Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now you pray for me and write to me. During these days, not many people write. I guess it's because there are a lot of people on vacation and weather's hot and a lot of things happening. But you write to me next week and it'll mean a lot to me. It surely will. As we work together and get out, getting out the gospel, glad to see Brother Doug Towns back in our service today. After a trip of surgery through the hospital, or through the hospital and surgery, I should say, and recuperating now, and he's back with us in the service today. We're glad to see him. Always glad to see our people that miss out because of illness when they're able to come back and be with us. All right, Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. I hope you found the place. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shadam two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And the women came unto Harlot's house, named Rahab, and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, where the men went out, what not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. And she had brought them, up the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they was pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And behold, they were laid down. And behold, they were laid down and she came upon unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know the Lord has given you the land and that your terror is falling upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you 
when you came out of Egypt and what he did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Zion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts didn't melt, neither there remained any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I've showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. And that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brethren and my sisters, all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you are not our, our business, this is our business. It should be when the Lord has given up the land, we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And she let them down by a cord through the window, for houses upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get ye to the mountain, lest he pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren. All and so speaking on that subject, the person whose life hung by a thread, and you may write in and get this tape, It'll be a blessing to you. Even the singing and the music today will be well worth you writing in for. And I hope you'll do so. Now there's several things I want to say about this woman uh, Rahab. And uh, what is meant by hanging the court out the window. Now you must remember that the Bible called her Rahab the harlot. Because she was a harlot before God saved her. Just like over in the New Testament where God saved and cleansed the leper. And yet he was still called Simon the leper. He was no longer a leper because he'd been cleansed. Rahab was no longer a harlot because she'd been saved and cleansed by the power of God. But she's called, she's called in the Bible Rahab the harlot. Number one, I want you to notice her lost condition. Now you must keep in mind here that General Joshua is leading the army of the Israelites, the people of the Israelites, that is the people of God called the Israelites, across the river Jordan into the promised land. God had called him, commanded him to lead his people in, and that he was doing. And God had condemned this land and this people. God was going to let them destroy them and give the Israelites the land of Canaan. And of course, whenever... They got ready to go over. Uh, then Joshua sent a couple of men to reconnoiter the land to see what it was all about, especially the city of Jericho. I've been there at this place several times, probably some 14 different times I've been here at this city of Jericho in my Holy Land tours. And this woman lived here inside of the city wall, lived on the wall, if you please. I often wondered what happened and how when that wall fell down did just a portion remain standing and her house on the wall. And so we'll have to find out about that later when we get to heaven. But I want you to notice her lost condition. Here's a woman that was lost. She was condemned. She was on the road to hell. She was a harlot. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. She was a sinner. According to the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she received the spies with peace. So she was a sinner, but she perished not with those that believed not, because she believed. Not only was she a sinner, not only was she a harlot, but she was a liar. At verse 4 you will find that she lied to the king there in uh, Jericho, on the inside the walls of the little city of Jericho. And she was condemned along with the entire city. Now God had already condemned this place and 
God had singled them out to be destroyed. And he told the Israelites, you can go in and take the land. It is yours. All you need to do is go in, believe that, and take the land, the promised land. It's yours. Now they never did take it all because of unbelief. But God said, it's yours. All you need to do is take it. But most of them were afraid to attack and move in and do what God told them to do. So she had notice the lost condition. Secondly, she believed the word of God. That's the real secret. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31 that she believed the word of God. She believed what these men said. She believed what she had heard about the Israelites. And so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. And so she had heard what God had done. How that these people had crossed the Red Sea by a miracle. And how God had destroyed a couple of kings and their kingdom on the way in. And she believed that. In the book of Joshua chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. As she said unto the men, I know the Lord has given you the land. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. Now you must remember that Joshua had sent these men in to reconnoitre the city. To get the information for of them because he needed that information whenever they went in to attack the, the village. Now some of you have been in the army and during wartime maybe. So was I. And there's been times whenever our captain would send out a couple of men to spy out our village or uh, check out a situation before we made an attack. And they would go out and check it out to get what information they could before the, we set off for the attack. Now that happens in battle, in combat. Whenever you're going in to attack the town, a village, or some uh, land or whatnot. And they did that in biblical days. And they still use that same method today. Always send out those scouts to go out and check out the land. And so he sent these men in to check out this little town, the city of Jericho. God had condemned it. It was under a curse. It was to be destroyed. And Joshua, the great General Douglas MacArthur of his day, uh, wanted all the information he could get to go in and conquer the little town. Number three, she set out to do good works. Now, not only did she believe the word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we know that she heard the word and she believed the word she believed in God and now she sets out to do some good works in James chapter 2 and verse 25 likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messages and sent them out another way now let me point out something here for you she was not a soul was not saved by works. A soul was saved by believing in God, by trusting God, just like anyone else, saved by faith. But she showed forth she was saved by the good works she did. Now you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we believe in a faith that causes people to work for God. Now, if a man is truly saved, there's a desire in that person to do something for God, to work for God. He's inclined to lean in that direction. Now, you show me a person that's made a profession of faith. He never shows any desire to do anything for the Lord, not concerned about the things of God. Then I show you a man that's only made a profession and has no possession. He's never really been saved. Just as certain as you have been saved, there's something on the inside of you that will cause you to want to do something for the Lord. Might not be what you'd like to do, and might not be as much as you'd like to do. But there is a desire in you to make a move about the things of God. If there's no move in your life about the things of God, you're still dead. Dead people don't move for God. 
Dead people have no desire to do things for God. Dead people cannot do things for God. You're still dead in trespasses and dead in sins. Now this woman here whose life was hung by a thread, uh, she had a desire to do some good works. She believed in God. She was saved. And then she set out to hide these spies lest they be destroyed or killed by the king there in Jericho. And she cut them upon the roof of the house and covered them with flax that they might be hid when people came to search out her house. And so she did some good work. She did everything she could to help these people. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2, Be not forgetful, entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. And so she was entertaining these men. She is trying to help them out, to spare their lives. She knew they were out of the camp of God. They were from among the Israelites. She knew that. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, By faith worketh by love, but faith worketh by love. So she was concerned about them. She put forth a special effort. She saved by faith, and now she's manifesting some good deeds, good works, a good act here to the glory of God and for the sake of these men. She knew they were from the camp of God, that is from the Israelites' camp. She knew that. She knew God was with them. She had already confessed that. She knew that God had seen them across the Red Sea. She knew that God had destroyed a couple of villages and on their behalf. She knew that. And she believed that with all of her heart and believed in God with all of her heart. And now she's going to do something about it, even jeopardizing her own life to protect them. She loved God that much. She loved God's people. Number four, I want you to notice her life hangs by a thread. In Joshua chapter 2 and verse 18, Behold, when ye come into the land, or when, when ye come into the land, thou shalt bind, when we come to the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou shalt have led us down by. And she sent them away, and they departed, verse 21, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Now she told these men, you must escape, you must leave, move in a hurry, because they're going on the outside of the wall, and I'm searching for you, and they'll be returning, and I want you to escape and get away from here before they come back, because they might discover you. And they said, all right, we're leaving. She said, now I want you to uh, be concerned about me and remember me now when you come to attack Jericho. And they took a red cord, a red rope as it were, a red string, I don't know how large. And of course they had a window on the outside of the wall, a little window. They lived up on the city wall, she did. And they had a window on this outside. They hanged, of course you can see out the back on the outside of the wall. And they said, I want you to take this cord and hang it out that window. Now that was the same cord she let them out by with. You know, they, she let them down with that cord and they escaped. So it must have been quite large, a strong one. And they said, you leave this cord hanging in your window. Because when we get back to the camp, we're going to inform Joshua that you took care of us. You gave us information we needed, protected us, and saved our lives. And we're going to tell him there'll be a red cord hanging out a window on the wall of Jericho. Now remember, they marched around that wall seven times. Around that wall they went before it fell. And each time they went around, that cord was hanging out that window. Now Joshua knew that. And Joshua had already informed his army, when you go into Jericho... Don't harm the people in the house where the cord is hanging out the window. Don't harm them. And so her life was hanging by a thread, and that was a red cord, which is a symbol of the red blood of our dear Lord that was shed on Calvary that we might have eternal redemption. So her life was hanging by this rope, and there she depended entirely upon that red cord that her life might be saved or spared. And that was important to her. Just like in the land of Egypt, when God and the angel passed through, 
and said, when we see the blood, we'll pass over you. They banked on that blood. They depended upon that blood as their protection. And so it was here. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And if you don't depend upon the shed blood of Jesus Christ for salvation, for your protection, you're in bad shape. Because that's the only way you can be saved, the only way you can be protected. Number five, she is concerned about her loved ones. That's another good sign that she was saved. I believe with all of my heart, whenever you get saved, you're going to be concerned about your loved ones. Many times when we get prayer requests, some of you say, lost loved ones. Lost loved ones. You're concerned about them. Oftentimes we go into the prayer room before the service to pray. And some men will say, remember my lost children or my lost loved ones. Now, if you are not concerned about the spiritual welfare of your lost loved ones, you better check up. You might not know God. Now, if you're saved, surely you don't want to see your loved ones go to hell. And just as certain as you listen to the sound of my voice, if they don't get saved, they go into hell whether they believe in hell or not. That's right. It may be your brother. It may be your sister. Maybe your mother or your dad. Maybe your children. If they don't get saved, they're going to hell as certain as you're listening to me today. And if they're going to hell, they want to be concerned about them. The rich man in hell said, send them back, send Lazarus back, that he might inform my brothers, witness to them, lest they come to this place of torment. And your brother's lost is going to hell if he don't get saved. My brothers that are lost, they're going to hell. They're going to burn in hell if they don't get saved. Your brothers, your sisters are lost. are going to hell if they don't get saved. If you have a lost mother and dad, they're going to hell. They'll, they'll scream in hell if they don't get saved. If you have children today that are lost, they're going to hell. And they'll scream in hell in the burning fire of hell if they don't get saved. Now, if somebody don't win them to God, that's exactly where they're going. Now, this woman here got saved, and she said, I want my loved ones to come into my house and be spared also. And if you're saved, you want your loved ones to go to heaven. You don't want them to go to hell. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I've showed you kindness, you'll also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters, and all that I have, and deliver our lives from death. Now Rahab the harlot said to these two men, I want you to spare my mother and daddy. I want you to spare my brothers and sisters. I want you to spare all of my relatives. I want you to spare them. They said to her, if you will have them in your house when we come in, everybody in that house behind that cord will be spared. It was a red cord that made the difference. And everybody in your family that's been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ will go to heaven. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes a difference. And if they haven't had the blood applied by faith, they're still lost. Number six, I notice, I notice the risk she took. She endangered her life to the king. Now the king came down or sent a committee down or sent the officers down to check out and find out if it's in her house. They heard, he had heard that those spies had gone into her house. Somebody had seen them go into her house. And of course they knew they'd gone in there. They'd searched out the village. They couldn't find them. And the king sent down a, a, a officers for a force of officers or whatever they had to go and check out the people, the police force or whatnot. He sent them down to look in her house and see where those men were. They had been seen going in there. But she had hid them up on top of a roof and covered them up with flax and they could not be seen. They were hid under the flax. Now she jeopardized her own life. Had they found those men hiding in her house, 
she would have most certainly been put to death. No doubt about it. She endangered her life uh, by the king because he'd have put her to death had they not if had they found those men. In Romans chapter ten and verse ten, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession made unto salvation. And Matthew chapter ten and verse thirty three, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And Luke chapter nine and verse twenty six, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and the holy angels. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, But the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake. Now here she jeopardized her own life in order that uh, she might spare the lives of these men that had come in to spout the land. She wanted to do that. She knew they were God's men. She knew that uh, they were sent over there for a purpose. She knew that. And her land, her city was already condemned. Had a curse on it and condemned to be destroyed. And she knew that. And she endangered her life. A lot of times people go to a great risk in order to get out the gospel. Especially people in other lands, not necessarily here in America. But people in other lands will jeopardize their lives many times to get out the gospel. And we appreciate it. Number seven, I want you to notice her reward. First of all, her life was saved. That means a lot. Her life was saved. Now, she would have died with the other people there in Jericho had this not happened to her. Her life was saved. Not only was her life saved, but her family was saved. That's wonderful. Her family was saved. And she abode in the camp of Israel with God's people. Now, notice what happened. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 25, And Joshua say, Rahab the heart of life, and her father's household, and all that she had, and she dwelled in Israel unto this day, because she hid the messages which Joshua sent to spout Jericho. Now when that army came in, Joshua chapter 6 and verse 25, you notice that her whole entire family was spared. They brought them back over to the camp of Israel, introduced them to Joshua and said, Now this is the woman that spared our lives and protected us and gave us information that we needed, and this is her loved ones. We promised that we'd spare them. So they brought them in, and there the entire family, her entire family, joined up with God's people, the Israelites. They all believed and trusted God. Not only that, but something else she did that's with great significance. And that is she married Salmon, a man by the name of Salmon. And he, he was probably one of these spies, could have very well been Saul. But she married him as she became acquainted with the people there in the camp of Israel. She met this man Salmon, maybe one of the spies, I don't know, doesn't say but she became acquainted with him and they fell in love with each other and she married him. Now she was Rahab the harlot, but not a harlot any longer. God had forgiven her for all of her sins and God had cleansed her from all of her past sins and she was a saint of God, born again, washed in the blood of Christ. I don't care what you've done before you're saved. How far you've gone in sin. How many sins you've committed. When you come to know God. God cleanses you and washes you. From all of your sins. You may have been a harlot. You may have been a whoremonger. You may have been a gambler. You may have been a murderer. You may have been a bootlegger. You may have been a cursor. But when you come to know God. All of your past sin goes under the blood. And God cleanses you and God never sees your sins anymore. You're as white, clean, and pure as any other saint of God in the family of God. Now the ungodly people of this world might look down upon you and try to bring up your past, but not God. Not God. She was not Rahab the heart and long. She was Rahab the saint of God, the wife of Salmon. And she went down in history as a great mother in Israel. She came the mother of Boaz. You remember him? 
Boaz married Ruth. You remember her? And through their union came a son. And on through their union came, uh, through uh, their descendants came David, King David. And through King David came our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God took this harlot. Her name is mentioned in the New Testament as well. And God took her, made a saint out of her. And she became one of the mothers of Jesus, as it were. Through her descendants came the blessed Son of God, the mother of our Lord according to the flesh. Now you need to realize that God can cleanse you from all sin, forgive you of all your sins, blot out your past life, write your name in him, and make something out of you. There's a very wealthy man one time. His wife went bad and ran away and went astray and lived a terrible, sinful life of sin. But he loved her with all of his heart. He wanted her back so badly. And he searched and he ran ads in papers to see if he could find her. And he put uh, uh, pictures on walls in various places where maybe she might go and, and that she might see those pictures and, and put his picture on the wall. She, he wanted her back. One day he received a call from a funeral home. And the man in the funeral home said, Sir, said I have a corpse here in my uh, funeral home. And I've seen a picture in say, one of the saloons. And saw the ad you ran out inquiring about her. And said it might be her. It looks like her. Would you come and see? And the wealthy man said, Yes, I'll be there in a matter of, of time. I'll get there as quick as I can. And he went to the funeral home. And sure enough, it was his wife. He loved her so dearly. You know what he said to the man at the funeral home? He said, I want the best coffin you have. I want the most beautiful gown you can bear her in. I want the beautiful flowers. I want some placed on a grave. And he said, sir, I want you to put a marker at the head of a grave. And on that marker, I want you to put these words. All is forgiven. Just those words. All is forgiven. He is willing to forgive his wife. For what she had done. Now that's the way it is with Jesus. When you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. All is forgiven. All your past life. And God starts you anew. It's wonderful what he did to Rahab. And for Rahab. What he did for Rahab. He'll do for you. He'll do for me. We have a great God. And I'm glad. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to have. A couple of verses played on the organ, but Debbie. But before we do that, we're going to pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name now that you'll use the message, not only here, but out yonder in the radio listen audience. Thank you for your power and grace. You can save a sinner. You did save me, a lost, weak and sinner. You saved others. God, I pray you save somebody today. Have you and use the message, I pray, dear Father. In the name of Jesus, our dear Lord, amen. Now, as Debbie plays, if you're here unsaved, or you're here backslidden on God, or you're here and you want to come forward for any reason, join the church or whatnot, come on down now while she's playing a couple of stanzas. Would you do it? While we wait, will you come? Just come right on down. We'll help you. We'll do what we can for you. Anyone? 